Okay, so yeah, my name is Joshua. Uh, I'm dialing in from the UK. Good morning to you all. Um, I work in Verizon's open source program office. I want to talk a bit about securing build platforms. Um, what's a build platform versus a build system? A build platform is basically the software, hardware, and people that um, you have to trust to um, have confidence that uh, a built artifact is what you expect it to be. It was produced how you expected it to be produced. Um, why, why might we care about that? Um, well, uh, open source has a lot of, um, very kind of hopeful notions. So Linus's law was kind of invalidated, but I think the concept speaks to a, a wider expectation, um, which is that if I, if I look at the source code and I give myself some confidence in the source code by doing that analysis, then, um, the, the, the kind of package or the project can be trusted. But um, people rarely consume source code directly. Typically they're producing some kind of, they're consuming some kind of uh, artifact, a package, um, and that is a composition of the source code, some kind of recipe that tells you how to build the source code and the, the builder that uh, performs all of the operations. Um, but we, we still have this, this expectation that um, the artifact was produced from the kind of the expected source using the expected recipe and on a somewhat trustworthy builder. Um, but as we have seen time and time again over recent years um, and, and at an increasingly alarming pace, uh, this is uh, often not the case. So I've got a few screenshots of um, different attacks on uh, build platforms. So uh, this one was someone uh, made a malicious kit commit to a GitHub repository um, and was able to uh, compromise um, a component and uh, benefit from some cryptocurrency uh, stuffing. Um, a little bit closer to home, I think for many of us, uh, the the core source code management repository for PHP was compromised and commits were introduced to that project, which seemed to be authored by very trusted and senior members of that community, but actually were not at all authored by those people. Uh, quite a long time ago now, the Webmin project was compromised for a very long time uh, because the build system was building from a modified source tarball. So they were, uh, the, the source code all checked out, the tarballs that people were downloading um, from the internet all seemed to check out, uh, but the uh, actual built product was um, somewhat seriously compromised. Uh, there's also been um, attacks where people have become trusted maintainers in communities, um, taken over uh, like some of the responsibilities for packages, uh, and then added malicious dependencies, which have done things like uh, scraping crypto currency wallets and um, profiting from that. Uh, very famously, uh, the SolarWinds software um, was targeted by a nation state attacker and there was a pretty sophisticated compromise of their build process, which resulted in um, a, a piece of source code being replaced at build time um, to build a compromised version of the package. And uh, <clears throat> the the CodeCov um, tool, uh, was compromised such that um, many tools and users were pulling a script from their website uh, to utilize the tool and um, not verifying that script against the published checksum and an attacker was able to upload a modified version of the script and get away with doing uh, dastardly things on CI systems for quite a long time. So this is uh, a, a very brief tour to paint a kind of somewhat intimidating picture. Um, and now let's think, what can we do about it? And, and one of the things that um, I think is, is important to bear in mind is that uh, Linux distributions have been, and, and Linux distribution build platforms have uh, a much stronger starting point than uh, most CICD pipelines and build platforms. The packager is typically an additional role which adds additional checks to um, the whole process uh, very often or usually uh, Linux build systems have a recipe um, which goes through some kind of peer review process. Uh, distributions tend to cache or mirror um, the inputs to the build, not just pull them directly from the upstream 
each time they want to perform build. And fortunately, we've largely moved away from uploading locally built binary artifacts to our distribution archives. But that doesn't mean we should be complacent. Um, so let's take a look around and see what other people are doing to uh, solve this kind of problem. Um, Google has a very sophisticated system called binary authorization for Borg, which as I understand it is part of a larger effort to increase the sophistication of, or this was a historical effort, but to increase the sophistication of Google systems to defend from insider threats. And one of the key tenets of binary authorization for Borg is that um, changes cannot be affected without multi-party appro multi approval uh, and going through some kind of review process. So uh, single uh, malicious actor can't uh, compromise the system significantly. Um, in adjacent spaces, we're seeing a lot of um, kind of different package managers, open source package managers, uh, taking steps to um, pardon their uh, kind of pipeline. So here you can see that the homebrew um, system, which is kind of a user space package manager for uh, Mac OS and Linux systems, they're trying to uh, add um, an assertion that somewhat proves that uh, the, the binary artifacts are produced from the expected builder. Um, and the NPM project has similarly made uh, changes to link a package back to its source repository in a verifiable way. And uh, Linux distributions have also reacted to the recent changes uh, in focus of attackers to what, what's often called the software supply chain. Um, and so SUSE published a paper uh, on their website describing uh, how their uh, build platform, the, um, I can't remember what the acronym expands to, to nowadays, but OBS, their build platform, how that uh, implements various security features and what additional features they were looking to implement. Uh, and the Flatcar Container Linux um, has also been taking steps to prevent tampering and improve integrity uh, of their infrastructure. And um, people who either read my submission ahead of time or were paying a lot of attention will have seen this acronym pop up in many of the previous slides. SALSA is the Supply Chain Levels for Software Artifacts project. Um, and that is effectively, uh, Google took their binary authentication uh, for Borg uh, notions try to generalize them to be applicable uh, outside of the Googleplex and uh, published it as an open source project. Um, and so <clears throat> the key components of kind of a, a salsa architecture uh, that uh, an ecosystem kind of holistically adopts uh, this set of concepts so that they have a trusted platform which guarantees uh, some isolation strength and um, what we'll call what, what's called provenance generation, which is effectively uh, authenticated metadata describing uh, the inputs to the system. Um, and then they have a way to, uh, this eco ecosystem has to have a way to define what the expectations on the uh, ecosystem are. So a way to convey who is the, uh, what are the trusted builders? What is the kind of canonical source repository for a given package? Um, and exactly how those expectations are defined can be uh, can vary a lot by ecosystem. It might be trust on first use. So if I fetch uh, a package and it's built from source code in a given GitHub repository, and then the next time I fetch it, it's built from source code in a SourceForge uh, repository, I might um, not install that package and do some analysis before I trust it again. Um, but there are other mechanisms for defining these expectations. Um, for example, the Go, Go ecosystem doesn't um, doesn't strictly adopt Salsa, but they they do have this uh, their source code URIs are kind of embedded in their package namespace. So uh, if the source code moves um, between package versions, there's a, a mechanism to detect that and trigger some kind of analysis. Uh, and then the final piece of adoption would be some some verification that the expectations met and that the trusted platforms were used. So you might do this at uh, repository admission time if you're uploading to a distribution archive or you might do it in, at install time uh, within your package manager. There are doubtless uh, other options available. Um, and then to try and make this 
uh, set of abstract concepts a little more concrete. Um, I'm naming a system. Uh, as Philip said, it's just the one that I happen to be much more familiar with. I have worked on the Octo project for a very long time and touched most of the systems labeled in this diagram. Um, so if we take the diagram that was earlier, uh, that I used in the earlier slide that where I defined what a build platform is, this kind of maps that build platform to the different pieces of um, how the Octo project's uh, artifacts are built on their public infrastructure. Um, and then we can think about what would it take to adapt uh, or adopt Salsa within that ecosystem. Well, Salsa uh, is broken down into build levels and each level provides uh, increasing assurances that meet the uh, security objectives of the project. So Salsa build level one is that we generate this provenance, this uh, description of the inputs in the build process. Um, and we could do that with a build bot plugin on the Octo project system uh, pretty easily. Uh, we would then get to Salsa build level two by signer, signing that generated provenance to bind it to the, uh, the trusted builders. And that would already help us uh, detect attacks like the Cocoa and Webmin attack. Salsa build level three um, starts to add stronger requirements, which would require um, a little bit more significant efforts, uh, both from a, a strict engineering kind of hands-on keyboard implementation perspective, but also <laughs> maybe rethinking some of the ways that um, the Octo project uh, build systems are kind of hosted and deployed. So I've left that as an exercise for future. I uh, haven't gone into great detail about how we might achieve that here. Um, but that is ultimately um, my prepared material. So we've defined a build platform. Uh, we've talked about some of the reasons why we might want to secure a build platform. Uh, and I've made a proposal for how we might use the Salsa project to secure uh, a Linux distribution build platform. Um, and I spoke for quite a long time. Uh, apologies for that. Um, okay, does anyone have any thoughts on this? Um, I'm sort of curious, you didn't define the Salsa build levels, um, what they're looking for at each level. Um, what might they be looking for? What would you have to satisfy to get to level three? That's an excellent question. Um, so <clears throat> at level three, uh, it is looking for an a high level kind of a, a hardened build platform. So it's looking yeah. for strict isolation um, between the tenants of the platform and between uh, the platform level code that might generate the provenance and the um, the processes running on that platform. Um, and that's why it can be uh, more a little more invasive than some of the earlier levels. Yeah, okay. Um, Is, is any of this uh, shareable between build systems? Uh, uh, can provenance be be used by another, potentially by a different build system? In other words, yeah, is there question. cooperation possible? Yeah, absolutely it is. Yeah, there's, uh, there's nothing in the verification logic that um, binds it to a specific build system. There is a, so I, Celsa is a relatively new project and adoption is happening as the slides indicate. But right now, the kind of verification piece um, implicitly has this notion of, you know, you, you have these expectations, you, you know where you think, or something knows where the source code should be coming from um, and what builders it should be built on. And this is effectively a policy and we don't have a, um, a well-defined architecture or expectation of how you might define that policy and uh, use it across systems. But that is absolutely a goal is that you can generate uh, cells of provenance, which is a well-defined format uh, in, in multiple places and uh, kind of consume it in, in disparate systems and uh, evaluate it um, against a set of expectations and, and improve your confidence. And so there it's defining the expectations that is um, the missing piece there, I think. Uh, and to a certain extent, we need more, we need more systems generating the data that we can 
try to figure out how to plug together. But there's nothing um, nothing intrinsic that binds the provenance to the systems or ecosystems that generate it. So I was <clears throat> wondering, does reproducibility and having multiple agents or separate entities building it and getting the same result, does that factor in here somehow? Um, potentially, yes. Uh, it's a it's a it's a good question. Um, we haven't broken this down uh, in a way that we're all kind of comfortable with, and that's why it's not published on our website. But a few people have speculated about how you might use reproducible builds um, to uh, form this notion of a trusted builder without explicitly having to say this one system I trust and and. Think it will never be compromised. Um, there's certainly a synthesis, uh, and the earlier versions of Celsa did include the recommendation to use reproducible builds at higher build levels. Um, but we uh, we had a level four uh, before we hit 1.0, and we we pruned it for that initial release because we didn't have um, a set of security objectives that we were very confident in that could map to different ecosystems. So uh, yes, that's a very wishy-washy answer. I realized the the concept definitely fits. Uh, we're just not entirely certain how. Um, one of the challenges with a project like Salesforce is we're trying to map it to build systems across, uh, you know, lots of different domains. Um, yeah, certainly reproducibility is useful when it's achievable. Um, so there's certainly, yeah, there's lots of prior art there. Um, before Salsa was a thing, before reproducible builds, before supply chain security was like a hot term, um, there were people paying attention to this. So there's prior art in, for example, the Tor project, we're building a browser. A browser is a fairly complex assembled piece of software across a whole bunch of different things. Um, they were able to do reproducible builds of that. Uh, there's certainly the Open Embedded project has been involved in and the reproducible build summits and everything since the beginning. Um, Debian has been doing work there. Um, that's all. That's all nice. Um, that's all good. That's all valuable. Uh, not just saying where you're uh, for for you. You want to be able to answer the question. Okay, given this binary artifact, where did my sources? Uh, what went into building it? What what is the transitive dependency closure from a trust perspective and an integrity perspective on that on that artifact? Um, and so one uh, approach to solving that that. Uh, I think works extremely well uh, and is um, can generate the res these results not just in a, in a, oh, yes, we documented what our inputs are, but in, in a verifiable, provable way uh, is what Nix does. And so uh, in Nix, for those who aren't familiar with it, um, you have uh, every build of a package uh, cryptographically identifies all of the inputs that go into building that. And so after you have a build artifact, you can look at what is the tree of all of the things that went into building this particular package this particular time. And so uh, if you have stuff that's not reproducible, this is really useful. And you can go and see not just, oh, some diffiscope output of where, my, where does my reproducibility in this binary artifact come from, but where in my chain of dependencies might that be coming from? Um, and so that's that's really useful. And then that uh, is a whole ecosystem of stuff that's being built. And so there's you can check reproducibility across a whole in, a whole ecosystem. And one of the additional tools that they've built within that ecosystem is a thing called Trustix, uh, which the idea behind that is um, you would have. Uh, as part of the infrastructure of the ecosystem that provides the binary cache for here's your pre-built packages, you would also have a way for people to do distributed builds of all of the software that you have in that ecosystem and to be able to aggregate signatures of claims of, yes, I built this thing. Uh, and then when you go to trust an artifact, you can say, oh, yes, I will only trust this if N of M parties all agree and that's something that was actually built. So there was efforts to do that in Debian a while ago with like the Debian rebuilders. I don't know if that actually ever, um, I didn't follow it closely enough to know whether that ended up 
being usefully deployed in practice. I'm not aware of that happening. I'm not saying it hasn't, but um, that's so yeah. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting prior art there that's useful. Certainly useful if you can have reproducible builds. Also useful if you can't, and also helps you get there. Yeah, that's a really good um, kind of summary of the verifiably reproducible builds concept. And I think one of the one of the kind of trade offs that people have to make is whether they want to trust and harden a single uh, platform, or whether they want to try and build some kind of consensus around whether a uh, component is verifiable across uh, different builders, or or both for the you know the super um, paranoid or, or the very security conscious. So I assume that uh, that when you're talking about isolated builds, you're talking about using something like uh, virtual machines or containers, where you've got all of the toolchain elements like signed and verified. Is that correct? Is that how that's done, or is there some other secret sauce there? Yeah, the expectation uh, is that it's probably containers or ideally VMs. Um, Celsius tries not to be too prescriptive. Uh, one of the things we're trying to figure out is that when when platforms make these reasonable decisions, like uh, whether to use containers or VMs or some potentially stronger uh, isolation mechanism, um, how do they articulate that so that the people uh, consuming those packages can um, make a trust decision, right? Like it's okay, uh, it's all well and good for a, a platform to say, we build Salsa build level three uh, packages and you can trust us, but if you don't have any insight into uh, how that builder works and why are the, how they're making those assertions on what basis, um, it's not super uh, reassuring. And so um, effectively the platform has to make uh, certain uh, decisions about those kind of things and then be able to articulate them uh, to the to the end users. I, I would assume that in some kind of uh, utopian future, we might have uh, like a validated uh, Docker container, uh, you know, with either Debian or Ubuntu in it that was <clears throat> not necessarily those, but, you know, hypothetically that had you know and all the tool chains validated and all the other tools validated on the system so there were no leaks and and then if people built with that you could trust it but you'd have to sign everything so go ahead and get the guy behind you thanks uh it seems like we're this is this is really good we're concerning ourselves with the what um i'm curious how deep this goes into the is uh and and by that i mean you know, there's well-known cases of certain universities trying to test <laughs> test the vulnerability of the Linux kernel, those kinds of things. And I was really impressed with the reaction. Greg just walked out. I was going to bait him into responding here. Um, I was really impressed with the response by the Linux kernel team uh, to that. I think it was appropriate and well-measured. Um, we don't know the degree to which other projects do that. So the is... Uh, I, I hate to call it a credit rating, but is is there some sort of credit rating we could apply to like a level three uh, cert, um, certified build such that, uh, you know, only things above this waterline or maybe they're below the waterline, but we've done work to get them above that waterline or in it. So such that I just know if it's level three, the work has been done to ensure that the ingredients are also relatively pure. Um. I think that's an excellent question. Um, the the Salsa project is an open source project that's part of the Open Source Security Foundation, which is one of the Linux Foundation's uh, uh, child foundations, I suppose. Um, and within that organization, there have been discussions like, can we can we do some kind of certification of Salsa so that if uh, you know you go and uh, choose some builder and they have been um, and they are a certified salsa builder then you can have a high level of confidence in the produced artifacts uh, i just don't personally feel like salsa is uh, quite ready for that yet and so i haven't been too engaged in those conversations but i think it's an aspiration uh, one other thing that i i was wondering about is um 
Uh, air gapped build systems. Is is there a way of, of supporting that? It seems it sounds like a, in a lot of situations like this, um, network access is required in order to get a lot of these things. I've I've worked with a number of people where uh, essentially uh, all of their builds, um, all the inputs are, are in theory vetted, put into reposit private repositories, and and go from there. So. How does that work uh, in a situation where, where the build systems are completely isolated? Great question as well. Um, I I haven't uh, done a kind of in detailed analysis of this, but um, there is certainly support within the Salsa ecosystem for um, being able to verify claims where you don't have all of the evidence. So we have this uh, additional metadata format, which is called a verification summary attestation VSA. Uh, and basically that uh, is where you can say, um, I, I trust the previous evaluations by this system that this uh, artifact meets Salsa build level two, for example. And so you could, you could imagine air gapping uh, a bunch of binaries and doing that um, verification at air gap time and then producing this uh, attestation summary to say, uh, so it's sort of like a peer-to-peer -peer, um, trust environment, like G, uh, GPG or something, or less of a peer-to-peer -peer thing, and more of a kind of at at um, at the time the the air gaps environment was uh, caching all of the binaries. It it could do the right. verification against the um, the upstream sources and and attest that at this time, all the expectations were met. I'm sure that would probably help. Thanks. So. To respond to that, one of the things that we've done in the Cubes OS project a uh, long time ago um, was exactly that, make sure that you can get all of your inputs at one stage, verify them all, and then build everything in an offline environment. Um, and that's the, the build of the operating system is then done in a virtual machine that has no network interface. And that's been validated that, that I mean, that's my system runs at it, it works. Um, and then to your question about what is, I happen to know that at least as of the last time that I checked that the cubes is also what Constantine from the Linux Foundation is using to administer all the Linux Foundation infrastructure. So um, this is a thing that is being done and it's not just cubes also. So Nix uh, benefits from this as well in a generalizable way that doesn't require work being done up front for your particular project. Um, the way that they do that is with when you have a derivation, which is their name for a build script kind of um, you uh, and you're you're doing this in the normal build sandbox, there's two modes that you can be in. One is a somewhat hermetic environment where you don't have access to the outside world. And so the theory is your output should be a pure function of all of your inputs. And then sometimes, of course, you do need access to the outside world to, for example, fetch things. Um, when you do that, the default way that all of these packages are written is such that your output should be what's, out, what's called a fixed output derivation, where you should know a priori the hash of the thing that you're trying to download. And so, for example, if you're fetching sources, you would have, okay, yes, we are fetching this using uh, curl, git, whatever, and a network, and it's some highly variable thing, but we can verify that the output is fixed. And so that means that uh, transitively, everything in your system either uh, is a pure function which should be reproducible or uh, has side effects and interacts with the global world, but the extent to which that can permeate through the rest of your infrastructure is bounded at that point by requiring that the output be fixed and known by its hash. So that's a, that's a solution that I found in practice generalizes quite well. And I've used that for things that are not operating systems, like even just, you know, building random firmware for embedded stuff that's, that doesn't even like have a kernel. Like this is, it's a, it's a pretty, and, and as applications too, like this is a, um, a, a pretty good approach. I, 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 I well, no, sorry. Uh, I have found this approach to be beneficial. Yeah, there we go. Just want to say that um, the what I'm talking about goes a little bit further than that. When I said air gapped, I mean literally no network connection between the build systems and the rest of the world. So, um, it, so you know, there's only so much that 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 you can prove. Uh, in that situation, the code essentially has to be hand carried from one system to the other in order to get things to work appropriately. Um, it, it's a very difficult problem, um, and and uh, one where 
quite often there are people that in theory vet the code crossing that gap, which then makes it very hard if they don't vet all of the appropriate code that was built as a part of the, the reproducible boot build in the first place. But um, um, I appreciate your, your answers and I, I'm sure that all this stuff is going to be very helpful <laughs> for the people involved. There's also an interesting side effect for this kind of hermeticity. Um, we're using this for the Android kernel builds to like have all the inputs um, like on disk and no network access during the actual build. Um, and, and, and the benefit basically is because we are, we are building a system that is used by many partners. It's run on arbitrary infrastructure, but we, for the binary that comes out of there, we guarantee ABI stability, um, no matter where it's built and when it's built and by whom. And so like the side effect of these hermetic builds, obviously that, that you have less of, less of issues, you know, with that. You know, so like the, the amount of bug reports you get where the build is actually at fault, um, and things that you cannot reproduce in your lab anymore are like going towards zero. If you have hermeticity uh, as a, as a standard. And even if you're just saying hermeticity and reproducibility is a, a different beast, um, to that. But if you're close, getting close to that and know the unknowns um, or like the things that are preventing you from that, um, yeah, that, that's really beneficial as a side effect besides the security aspect of it. Just pointing out that it's on, on the chat. Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> I think Masahiro is pointing out that there's um, documentation in the kernel build, uh, cabled documentation for reproducibility. Um, yes. And there's, there's uh, of course, reproducibility of, of individual uh, built projects. And then, of course, at the, the system level as well. And of course, depending what area you work on, it's going to be one or more of those kinds of things. So but all those are very important. Uh, are there any, um, we're just coming down to the last five minutes or so of, of the space. Are, are there any last questions that people want to, uh, things people want to add to that? Do you have that one? It's probably worth giving a pointer and shout out to the bootstrapable builds project too. So um, your point earlier about like, oh, or this is your point about um, it'd be great if we had this Debian container, Ubuntu container, virtual machine or whatever. That's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of software in there that you have to trust. Having, <laughs> having a, a minimal environment for like ha having the the size of your TCB for building, the size of your, the set of things that you need to trust, the, tr the transitive dependency closure from an integrity perspective, um, be proportional to the, the size of the set of dependencies that you have for what you're actually trying to build is, is, is nice. Um, again, Nick's and, and Geeks do that really well. Um, the, or yeah. Um, the other thing is, there's the question of how you arrive at that builder effect in the first place, and there's all the reflections on trusting trust style issues. Um, so the bootstrapable build, the bootstrapable builds folks have done a really excellent Herculean effort to uh, go from not ha to, to bootstrap such a such an environment, right? Because how do you trust that initial binary? How do you trust that initial image? How do you know that that's not already backdoored? That is a an when you don't know whether you can trust your software supply chain, that is an important problem. Um, and uh, the bootstrapable builds folks have done uh, some really great work that is relevant and worth taking a look at uh, to be able to get to that initial point. And it's also well integrated in, in Next and Geeks. So I just dropped a couple of links in the chat to a Geeks blog post describing their uh, full source bootstrap using the bootstrapable builds project and then the bootstrapable builds projects website as well. Uh, they're great references. Oh, that's Thank, awesome. you. Thank you very much. Any last thoughts? If not, we'd like to uh, thank our speaker. Thank you very much, Joshua. We really appreciate your time and uh, slides and, and thank you very much for bringing all this stuff and of course everybody's input on the topic as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks everyone for the discussion. <laughs>